Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> you can open the eyes again. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here for our reading uh, for Kipuka, which um, we just released. Uh, so the full title was Kipuka, Finding Refuge in Times of Change. And I'm Brenda Kwan, one of the editors. Um, another editor is Misty Saniko, the one who's holding the book up in front of her face. And then we also have Meredith Enos and uh, Don Carrera Chang. So again, we're just really happy to have this talented group of writers bring their work to us and for you to be able to hear them. And I'd also like to thank HCC for allowing us to present today. Okay, so for this issue, um, we began the project in 2019 and we, it started off as a very regular type of process. We were looking at writings and all of that, and then COVID happened, you know? And then as we were trying to adjust, uh, we started thinking, you know, we need to ask about things that are going on, Black Lives Matter, COVID. So we started to open that up and it still had the central question of if nothing's static, particularly right now in life, then where do you find your refuge? What anchors you? What keeps you rooted here? So the issue, that question covers many significant areas and themes. Uh, the writers will talk about things from colonialism to demilitarization, loss and grief, climate change, Mauna Kea, water rights, immigration, cultural identity, and pa the pandemic. And it also features uh, a real attention to language. So we have uh, works that are in Hawaiian pidgin and Olala Hawaii, and um, we also have a diverse collection of writers, both emerging and established, many of whom are new to Bamboo Ridge. We're happy to have you. And it also features four contemporary Hawaii artists, Nanne alum, Corey Tom, Maika Itubs, and also Wooden Wave. So it's a really nice issue to flip through. We have the art distributed. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what I'm gonna do is we have five readers for today. So I'll introduce each reader. They'll read their work. And then at the end of that, we'll open it back up for Q&A, okay? All right, so first up, uh, we have Zach, sorry, did I just mess up your name? I did, Zach Lindmark. <laughs> Zach and I have uh, a history that um, involves alcohol that I won't go into right now. <laughs> just kidding, not kidding. Okay, he was born in Manila and he grew up and was educated in Honolulu. He is currently the writer in residence at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, where he holds the Roger F. Murray Chair in Creative Writing. His piece, National Crisis, could not have been written without wet market-based viruses, dangerous dictators and wannabe presidents, endangered pangolins, and this crazy world, and it's even crazier in denial, degenerating denizens. When asked what type of beverage he would be, were he to be a beverage, he said, Kamu Cognac. All right, so let's hear from Zach. All right. Um, good evening. It's like seven, eight here in, in Andover. National crisis. It's terrifying, this rapidly spreading giant panda pandemic. America is now illiterally infected, education resistant, ignorance insured, a bug gun viral menacing, multiplying, hostile takeover, hostaging country club economy, endangering CEOs, VIPs, commander in chiefs, pork baron privileges like a tribe of pangolinistas in denial of impending gloom despite daily doom meat market crashes corpse to be corporations, inevitable shutdowns of stocks and cents, shed of reality placed under strict quarantine, sometimes hyphenated quarantine or quarantine spelling, depending on race and region. Right. So I want to thank you, um, Brenda and Donald and the other editors for including me in this I can't wait to get my hands on it. I'm just going to read a short piece from my uh, forthcoming novel called And the Winner Is. And it's a pretty much um, it's a high school poetry contest that's set in 1986 in Hawaii. So this is a sonnet from Georgina Akiona, who's a senior at Roosevelt High. 
And this is a sonnet after Shakespeare's sonnet 18. I take you over Barbie any day, Sports Illustrated, Playboy Bunnies too. And though penthouse centerfold angels may drive me wild on Electric Avenue, they no can compare to you. You get class, you brown, speak pigeon, your thighs thunderous. But I'm not dumb, I know beauty don't last. Like one loaf of love's bread, delicious. Then after a couple of days, hold a bugger, come on moldy, musty, taste like wet dirt. Right now you in my eyes is forever until time says no more. But what a flirt. As long as I can see and not senile, this moment going lasts for a little while. Thanks. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you so much, Zach. We'll see you in a bit. Uh, the next readers, uh, we're so lucky to have Daryl Lum here, who uh, will never say this, but he is a pillar of local literature. Yep, you. <laughs> Um, so he used to edit Bamboo Ridge a long time ago. Uh, he says nowadays he write any kind and try to make the editors laugh, which you did, you did, you did. And then we also have a um, special guest reader today, our editor, Misty Sanico, who, uh, let's see. Oh, where did it go? Okay, she's a writer and editor from EVA. Uh, Kipoka is the second edition that she's edited. I'm sorry, second collection that she's edited. And um, she's really happy to be here. Uh, Daryl says that if he were going to be a beverage, he would be a single malt Japanese whiskey, such as Hibiki, expensive. Huh? And then let's see, um, Misty comes ringing in with box wine sangria. All right, so let's give it up for Daryl and Misty. Okay. Um, let me turn off the. Trying to make it a little more quiet here. Um, I started writing a series of dialogues called Boy and Uncle. And for the longest time, I thought, well, boy, that's me. But then, of course, nobody else went believe. And they said, oh, you know, that grumpy uncle, that's you. So <clears throat> uh, Misty and I will be reading a couple of uh, selections from, from Boy and Uncle starting off with the one in, um, in this issue, okay? Boy and Uncle, Lockdown. Boy, what means lockdown? Supposed to stay home, except for essential things. Not supposed to go out, eat, go beach. Just like jail then. Yeah. But if you're in jail, you lock up. And if you forget your keys, you lock out. Why do you not call, call them lock in? Because you lock inside. No makes sense. A lot of things no make sense, uncle. No can go store, huh? Eh? Only for food, like that. But Last time I went market, I see all the people touching the lettuce. So I don't buy lettuce. I go buy celery. Get one young lady dressed all nice, fancy shopping bag, touch all the celery. Pick up, put down. Pick up, put back. I stay waiting my turn. She turn around. No, she changed her mind. Pick up, take one, two stock celery. She put the rest back. I don't buy celery. Why you no go kupuna hour, uncle? Go early, beat the crowd. You ever been kupuna hour? Only get old people over there. That's who kupuna is. Yeah, but kupuna go market like they're going sightseeing. Go up and down every aisle. Stop and read the can corn. Reach way in the back for the freshest one. I tell you, if the can expire in one year, you know not get the one that expire in two years, especially if you're going to open them tonight. Kupuna hour means they're going to take the whole damn hour. Kupuna not going in and out in 15 minutes. They buy three things, go home. 
then they come back tomorrow for buy what they won't forget. Yeah, you and Kupuna too, Uncle. You calling me old? You young boys, get them easy. Rice come in small bag, not 50 pounds. You know, rice used to come in cloth bag. Yeah, yeah. You were so poor, you had to wear rice bag underwear. Not me. I had real BVDs. Maybe not for every day, but I had underwear. Yeah. What? We can no need. Ugh. Ah, let's go get shave ice. Hot today. We can go take a ride in the car, get air conditioned. Yeah, but nowadays, if you catch ride with somebody not from your own house, you're supposed to ride with the windows down. How come? So get fresh air. So you don't breathe somebody else's air. And no can run the air conditioner. Just blow the germs around. Huh. Sometimes I ride with the windows down. When your auntie sneak one silent one and no say nothing, I stick my head out the window and say, ooh. Not true. No better. We just stay home and breathe our own stink foot air. The virus no can survive that. All right. Thank you so much. It is really nice to hear it read out with different voices and really appreciate the um, costuming. Nice job. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader, I'm so pleased to introduce Susan Schultz, who recently retired and also um, just became Professor Emerita. So good things definitely happening uh, in her post teaching career. So um, let's see, she was in the English department. Uh, she has 10 books of poetry, including the forthcoming Meditations from Talisman House. Uh, I got to read a little of that, and it's really something worth looking at. When you read it, you sort of end up jumping and riding the train of, of Susan's mind, which is a really neat thing to do. <laughs> and she edited um, and published Tin, fin Tin Fish Press for 24 years. So she just handed over the reins, right, to Jamie Nagel. And she says, um, well, her husband says that if she were to be a beverage, she would be soy milk. Uh, however, Susan says that she would be a martini with a green olive. How's that for a depth, right? Okay, thank you, Susan. Let's hear from Susan. Thanks. The, the joke about soy milk is I'm allergic to soy, so that's why that one. Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me and publishing me. It's really delightful to be here. Good to see uh, Daryl again after all these uh, minutes. Um, I guess my Kipuka was my dog. I got a dog named Lilith right about the time that our former president was inaugurated. And I thought that would help me to uh, protect myself from the orange menace. But when the next election came around, Lilith and I ran into a lot of people who wanted to talk about the election. So it was sort of counterproductive anyway. So here are a couple about walking through my neighborhood in a Huimanu with Lilith. American Anger, 8 August, 2019. The white man who hates millennials thinks that Hillary is the corrupt one while claiming to not like Trump and who walks a small fluffy one-eyed dog named Rosie crossed the street before Lilith and I got to him. I was walking toward Eva Street and he turned to walk in parallel. Then the yelling began, not from the corner this time, but from at least 50 feet away. That's a stop sign, jackass! He yelled at a woman in a blue smart car who had turned right onto Huikelu. I considered suggesting that yelling doesn't help, but thought better of it. When Lilith and I got back closer to home, the man with two fluffy white dogs, Mochi and Manju, told me he and his family were almost killed at that intersection by a speeding, swerving Acura. And I could tell you which woman always runs that stop sign, he added. The Snail Hunter of Kahalu'u, 25 April 2020. This is all, this is hyper-realism. This is just sort of, this happened. 
happened and then that happened. The woman who hunts snails with cooking tongs in her pajamas was smoking a cigarette outside her townhouse this morning, a long, thin cigarette. I asked if she'd injected bleach this morning. How long can we put up with that crap? She asked the smoky air. Still has her job, but expects a pay cut, has a mortgage to pay. No stimulus check yet, but she heard about someone who got hers a year after she died. The snails are fewer. They come out in the rain. The sister to Jerry, a fierce woman who walks bent at the waist, told me. A friend texted to say, this is just like Hitler. She's Jewish. Their brother, Jerry, says his education was a waste of their father's money watches Fox. If he so much as texts me or calls me or emails me, I told him it's going in the trash. It's his job, she told him, to make his wife smile, his kids smile, his grandkids. Does he want them to remember his hate? She's wearing a shirt with Paris on the front, a sketch of the Eiffel Tower. It's criminal, her husband Wally tells me as I continue up the hill with Lilith. Judy of the Lush Garden says, he's crazy, that one. The roses were getting smaller in their pots. Now they're bursting into bloom. And there's a lotus coming, too. I looked around thinking there was a Buddha in her yard, but I must have misremembered. And I was going to finish with a poem that has Brenda in it, or a prose poem that has Brenda in it, but something happened this morning. So Brenda, you're gonna to have to wait. No, so this, please. I'm like, do you? This was the, <laughs> this was my walk this morning. Lilith walk sans Lilith. She's not here with me right now. Judy was out gardening, as she often is. A small Filipina woman in her late seventies, looking under milkweed leaves for caterpillars. She has a screened-in butterfly birthing ward in her garage. Lamenting how few she'd seen lately, noting that where the leaves were chewed, lizards had gobbled up the little ones. She gave me a lovely purple flower, butterfly pea to put in water, good for antioxidants. I stopped, said, you know, I'm giving a reading today with Bamboo Ridge. What's that? Today, and you're in one of the pieces I'll read. She looked at me quizzically. It was a walk I took with Lilith where we talked to people about Trump, I say. Oh, at first what I liked about him was he didn't talk bullshit, she said. I suggested he was a liar. Oh, they all are. And Biden, he falls asleep. Why can't we have one young active type president? She showed me some of her new flowers, the purple ones and the less purple ones. Said she's got Africanized snails. I suggested buying some cheap beer and letting them drown themselves in it. Then found myself telling her about my other neighbor who picks them up with tongs and puts them in the dumpster. What I didn't say is that she's in the same bamboo ridge vignette as Judy. The pea petal is in a glass of water. I'm allergic to peas, but it shouldn't matter. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Susan. <laughs> Um, whenever I hear you talk about these walks, you know, I just give you credit for being so brave. You know, Susan has the conversation. She will talk, you know, to folks uh, who don't have the same opinion. So that takes some bravery. Thank you for that reading. Hey, um, <laughs> okay, so our next reader um, is, is honestly one of my favorites uh, in the youth poetry slam scene, which um, I was too old for, which is why I was watching. Anyway, when I was watching, there are so many poets who just really blew me away. And um, Nayo in particular was one that just resonated deep. And we're so, so grateful and honored that she's here to share things with us. Um, I feel like I'm making you nervous, so stop. Uh. <laughs> um, but she, in her bio, uh, she is a queer writer and performer born and raised on the island of Oahu. She has a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, digging into such themes as diaspora, identity conflict, queen, takata, pui, identity, and home in her writing. Her work has been featured in Tayo Literary Magazine, Hawaii Review, Flux Magazine, Lit Hub, and Ora Nui. And 
the beverage that she chose to represent her were she to be a beverage is not just coffee, but salted caramel, dark roast black coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's welcome Nayo. Um, thank you, Brenda. And um, thank you, Bamboo Ridge, for uh, letting me be included in this. Um, yeah, uh, I have two pieces in here. Um, and yeah, a lot of the, um, the place that I found myself uh, considering Kipuka, I guess, was um, the remembering that like, uh, I am like the place that I consider home and, um, you know, like I return to myself for culture and for remembering to be Maori, even while I'm separated, even while I'm separated from home and people literally like here in the pandemic. And so just kind of returning to myself and ancestors and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I'm a spoken word poet first and foremost. So a lot of my um, reading is gonna be kind of in that uh, tone. So yeah, um, this first piece uh, is called other people um and it's kind of like a conversation between people who want to tell me things that they don't need to tell me and then the last bit is um me kind of once again returning to my ancestors and myself come home go home the only way to connect is by being at home oh then will you pay for my ticket Give me on a plane every time I need it, or will you find the tree? Teach me how to carve and shape the waka. Show me how we used to move between motu, glide with it, hoi, hoi, hoiara, like horauta with it, all the way back to te tairafiti me. You should learn the reo. Kao, korero i te reo Māori, girl, you can make time for the reo, no excuses. So you're spotting the fees for the lessons then? Oh, shop bro, you topping up my hop cart as well since I'm probably bussing it to all these wānanga. How about when I wanna practice, will you practice with me? Or am I too tena for you? Will you promise to hold me when Matsua shames me in the marae? Get me a brand new blackened tongue since mine is too bleached. Blood. Blood, blood. Yeah, about that one. I don't remember where I put mine. Can I borrow yours, sis? Can you show me again how deep I'm supposed to dig? How much of the guts I need to show and how to put them all back in again when done? Will you send me the papers for the land after? For belonging? Will this hurt my future children as badly as it hurts their mother? Ko hikurangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko te ibu. How often have you sent uenuku just for me? How can I smell your smoky morning all the way from Hawaii? When I finally make it up the maunga, will you hold the sun for me? Why did it take me so long to open to you, to see you in the sky? the street, music, my smile, and how silly it be to ever let go after all that. And then the last one is uh, called Urban Native. It's a little bit longer and it's just kind of me speaking to people, kind of like the last one um, who want to tell me what it's like to be native and also about my experience growing up and finding my um culture in the city primarily so how do i tell all of them those natural healthy good natives ones with the nice sunsets on their lanai that locally grown and sourced budget 
No idea what it means to have the entire breath of a city so embedded in your everyday, not even the earth can fill you when you're ripped away from it. How do I tell them that I fuck with sweet potato, but only when it's next to some cow? That cheese on toast or a bag of Doritos is sometimes what I need after a hard day. That mom and dad did the best they could, but as many days as she cooked, mom also had to come through with the Happy Meal because either way, I need to get fit. Will they believe me when I say that I'm decolonized? Every post or status they make having something to say about a sustainable diet. How the body is now rinsed through with sovereignty. I grew up at the bottom of the mountains, so this is the only way I know. But I was raised on the white man's sugar. Crave it. Speak mana Māori motuhake in the same breath as, yo, can we stop at the jack-in-the-box on the way home? Will they acknowledge my type of chain-breaking? See my resistance as valid. I get restless in Kahalu'u and during the middle of the night in Glenfield. Love waking up to the sunlight but need a couple of cars outside to complete it. So, from good to bad, on the native scale, where do I sit? Where do I get placed? Sad half-blood with no taste for vegetables or the stomach to live too far out of the city. Tell me again how much time I'm shaving off my life by choosing the taquitos at the 7-Eleven over a kale smoothie. How much more connected to my heritage I would be gardening out in the Kumara patch instead of digging myself deeper into Waikiki and Chinatown's heartbeat. What do you say to each other when we aren't there? Us urban natives, the ones who never got the forest hikes growing up, hauled off for a workday in the Kalo patch, used to a Whopper and fries, but have a hard time when our own food is put on the table. Those of us who were born and brought up away from the Hokkaina, never taught our language, the cousin who watches and can't sing along, spent our first night on a marae at 21 and knowing that no matter what we will always be considered some sort of incomplete some sort of half not enough how much longer does it take for us to get there to become full like you when will my blood go from half bleach to ancestor brown what i would give to be like centuries past the amount of salt cemented into my face from all the crying. Imagine the mulivai I could make with it. How much of my later teenage years spent hating myself for my skin, for my diet, for the way my body reacts whenever it's surrounded by trees instead of buildings. I'm sorry. Now that I'm older, I've become less good at trying to make you like me wish I inherited farming and country living from my great grandparents, but I got a different survival out here on the margins. Recognize the value of growing up with family, but still hold the important lessons every adopted uncle and auntie on the corner of Liliwo, Kalani, and Clegghorn gave me in my youth. It'd be nice to have a vegetable every now and then, but I know that what I do with my diet has nothing in common with how the rest of this body gets liberated. I like that view over the bay at my sister Noah's house, but nothing beats the blending of the city lights as I drift off to sleep. I'm afraid my living, my native, my decolonized is something you're just gonna have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naya. Um, you know, when I hear you read, it, it makes me think about my students and how, you know, we talk about, I can teach you structure and language and grammar, but, you know, it doesn't matter unless you have something to say. And that's one of the things that always strikes me about your work is that it's just the voice is so strong and then you have the language on top of it. So it's just beautiful. Thank you. Okay, and last but definitely not least, uh, we have the pigeon gorilla, Lee Tonouchi. Okay, the Pigeon Gorilla's most recent book was his children's picture book, Okinawan Princess, The Legend of Hajiji Tattoos with artist Lara Kina, 
that won one 2020 Skipping Stones Honor Award. His Pigeon Poetry Collection, Significant Moments in the Life of Oriental Father and Son, Bess, won the, oh, by Best Press, won the 2013 Association of Asian American Studies Book Award. His auto book include his The Word, Living Pigeon, The Kind Dictionary, and Boss Laugh. He had a bunch of plays produced before by Pumukuhua Theater, the Honolulu Theater for Youth, and East West Player. No, wait. And East West Players, is that right? Okay. I didn't wear my glasses. I'm so sorry for stumbling. And then he's also one food critic for frolichawaii.com. Calm. If he was going to be a beverage, he said he liked be one pog. And if you don't know what pog is, Lee can explain no matter. Okay, welcome, Lee. You know, some people don't know, bro. Passion orange guava. How come? Why? All right. So as the world is getting crazy, um, I was thinking I have my people back in Okinawa, you know, they're fighting for peace. I was thinking, how can I connect to them? So I think, oh, you know. I can connect to them here by um, focusing on peace too. So I came up with all these peace poems. So I'm gonna share with you three of my peace poems that's in the book, yeah? This one is called Hawaii's Most Dangerous Job. Hawaii get all kinds of jobs, that's abunai. We get the regular dangerous kind like policeman, fireman, lifeguard, but every place get that kind. But most people don't know the scariest job in Hawaii, stay landscaping technician so sad like that i read them in the paper two brothers would get hurt just from cutting grass see these two guys were just regular civilian contractors trimming the weeds at the makua military reservation when all of a sudden their weed whacker would go bang some unexploded ordinance oh talk about false crack metal back like that when asked for comment on top of this tragedy the, ar the army spokesman had this for say, quote, the person closer had more injury and the other person was a little bit farther away and his injuries were less, but they were both severe, end quote. I don't know, but sometimes when you say stuff that's just so obvious, you know, it comes out sounding kind of dumb and a little bit insensitive too. Like the follow-up article that said, quote, pending the completion of an investigation, the army said it has stopped all grass cutting. It's like, for really? Okay. This next one is called, I don't know if, how many people used to watch Hawaii Five-O, but uh, pretty much we used to watch them regularly, yeah, but I, I heard of something called a uh, hate watching. Yeah? You just watch them so you can diss the show. Yeah? That, that's what we used to do. Anyway, this is called McGarrick Would Go. When Steve McGarrett went to Afghanistan and defeated the Taliban, that's when I thought Hawaii 5 0 would go jump the shock. But then how another one? When McGarrett had one building blown up on him and somehow he managed to survive, escape, and save Dano too. So then it's really not so hard to believe the recent episode where McGarrett saves Hawaii from total nuclear annihilation. Because in the show, the bad guys have to smuggle a nuclear warhead into our state. But in real life, ah, we just let other nuclear weapons come and go through Pearl Harbor. And local people, ah, we don't know what's going on. There's nobody really asking. But not like they would tell us anyway. The only way I know is because one time I was at one party and my friend's friend's cousin came straight from his submarine. So if we make the conversations, I want to go ask him, oh. I don't know if you allowed for disclose such information, but I just curious, does your vessel have, how shall we say, um, nuclear capabilities? And then all casual, he was all like, oh, hell yeah. Oh, like to him, it was the coolest thing in the world. Oh, that's nice for no, I thinking the fact that they gave a nuclear bomb about two miles from my house. Okay, and this last one. Oh, I kind of feel this is like one, kind of like almost in the tradition of Susan, yeah? Where you're just kind of walking around and you find one poem, yeah? Oh, so this one, I just saw one flyer, bro, and then the flyer inspired this poem, yeah? So this one is called The Normalization of War. 
Yeah, so this encourages people out there. Make sure you exercise. You can find all kinds of poems eh, when you're walking around. Okay, the normalization of war. One flyer for the Kanyohe Bay Air Show at MCBH says, go and get the Navy Blue Angels, the US Navy's premier flight demonstration team, along with rides for the keiki. On the bottom, it even invites schools for schedule one visit. In my mind, I imagine what future shows might include. Osprey petting zoo? Throw a grenade at the milk jugs? Bumper tanks? And dance dance wartime revolution, where if you step on top one landmine, your time is up. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. And thank you also just for, you know, making it your dharma to just make sure Pigeon stays alive, you know. Um, I was just talking to Zach about how many of us just had it beaten out of us, you know, when we got sent to private school or whatever. So thank you, Lee, and thank you, everybody. Um, what we're going to do now is to transition to any questions that you have for any of our authors. So you can just go ahead and type something in the chat and we can go from there. And I believe, let's see. Yeah, there is a Q&A feature, uh, but if you could go ahead and just put anything in the chat, that would work out. It happens in real life too. Okay, we, we have Patrice who's a pog lover. Hey, all right, all right. So I was told Oh, wait, so the POG is passion orange guava? Okay, well, then I drink pure pog. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> That's what you're thinking. I was like, no, can. What do you mean you never had it? <laughs> well, uh, so for Daryl, I like, know if, if Daryl's a uh, boy and uncle series, is that like going to be one book? Is that one book? Unmute. Unmute. Yeah, lately I've been doing sort of a series of boy and uncle. At first I thought it would be um, uh, the material for like a one man show, except it would be two people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it would be the first two-man, one-man show. Yeah, the two-man, one, one Ever. Show. Ever. Yeah, 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 it was, um, right. uh, I, I became aware of um, this, this Japanese comedic form called Rakugo, and it's a, it's a bare stage and a, a single actor, and he has a, like two props, like a, a fan and a, you know, and a sash, and so I thought, you know, what what would be like a local version of rock and roll? You know, of course, this would be neat. I, I, I suppose you could do it as a one man show and the one man doing both both voices. But anyway, it's kind of a just good fun way to sort of get something something down and we'll see what happens with it. All right. Okay, so we have a question for Nayo. Uh, Nayo, you still there? We got your avatar. Okay, so I'll just read this question out loud. Nayo, as a young author, do you still struggle with your sense of identity? If not, what has helped you overcome the struggle? Um, I, I don't struggle as much as I used to, um, like definitely like the stuff in this book, I think um, that I address, like people still talk to me like that. Um, but when I was younger, you know, like when I was a youth poet, um, definitely that was a lot harder, but uh, now that I'm like 28, it's been a bit, uh, I don't, I've just, I've had a lot more time to research and learn more and I've gotten to go back home to Aotearoa a few times and cultivate friendships and learn more on the ground there. And um, 
you know, that's really helped me to come into who I am as uh, Tangata Māori. And um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I struggle, but uh, I think what kind of keeps me in line um, is I just remember that like, nobody knows who I am better than I do. Um, as cheesy as it sounds, but like, I just don't let anybody tell me who I am. And um, that works most of the time now. So yeah, I don't struggle much anymore, thankfully. <laughs> You know yourself, uh, your, what is it? Your manual, right? You are your own self manual. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Hey, do we have any other questions from the audience? Because I have a question that I'm willing to ask but I'd rather see if anyone else has other questions. Okay, then I'm gonna ask mine. If you have one, just go ahead and type it in the chat. And this is for all of you. Um, I had asked this at the launch reading and I thought the answers were so amazing that I really want to know from the rest of you. So in your poetry, your writing, you know, we have a sense of artistically what gives you that grounding when everything else is just going by and changing and being destroyed. You know? In everyday life, what would you say is that thing that gives you the grounding, that gives you refuge? Oh, look at these thinking faces. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> you mean um, other than alcohol? Well, no, if alcohol's your answer, talk <laughs> about that. No, it's a real thing, no. right? <laughs> Daryl, what you been doing? Um, just trying to put one word after another. Um, and sometimes it gets harder and harder to do. I'm going to call on people. Susan. What do I do? Well, um, where do you find refuge? You know, um, so we talked about refuge in art. When you take that away and you're just thinking about living your life day to day, where is it that you find refuge? Well, part of it is the dog walks. And part of it's taking photos on my walks. And it comes out of something I did a lot of my last, oh gosh, eight years of teaching or something, which was to give students attention exercises, just to sit and look at something for a long time, like watch a football game, but watch something that's not part of the action of the football game. So watch the referee or the chains or something. So um, I've sort of taken that on as a practice and I find that it's a lot of fun. And then when I come back home, the world still stinks, but you know, there was, there were some moments. I can really see that in your poetry too. You know, Susan's poetry is beautiful. I'm sorry. in your pictures too. Um, Susan's photos will often take uh, a segment of an entire scene and it takes you maybe a moment or two to identify it as itself, it's a beautiful pattern. And then you understand it's just one part of something larger. Well, Lee, what do you do for refuge in everyday life? I think for me, the writing is the refuge. Because right? when you enter the water, writing is like you creating, you're in that world now, as you're creating either one story, one poem, one play, whatever it is I'm writing, I'm in that world. So for me, that's the refuge, right? Because it's my it's my way to get away from all the crazy that's out here. Yeah. Do you do you find just to tag on to what Daryl said? Sometimes it's hard to get the next word. You know, does that ever happen to you? And and then what happens? Where's your refuge? <laughs> I don't mean that confrontationally. I was just like curious. Okay. <laughs> like, who gets writer? Like so once you go, you just go. Like like I guess the hard part is just getting started. Like for me, I. I like, I don't get blocked once I'm going. Mm -hmm. But to start is the hard part. You got to find the time to start. Right? Got it. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, Nayo, where is your refuge? I know you talked about uh, the meat pies, you know, at 7 Eleven, which I loved that answer. Um, 
I don't know if it's still that or if it's something else, you know? Yeah, it's still meat pies. Um, <laughs> those are pretty important to me and they like take me right back home. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say writing is too, but I, um, that I can't do all the time um, or else I get, you know, frustrated trying to start if I'm not inspired or anything. So whenever that hits me, that's a refuge. And then, um, yeah, meat pies and taking walks taking walks really really helps oh, we got a lot of walkers here <laughs> I love it. there's something about let's take that. a walk sometime <laughs> together apart yeah <laughs> <laughs> um misty what do you do for your refuge i talk to my mom on the phone like every day for like an hour a day about everything wow. and nothing and just yeah so definitely my family, um, Sims 4, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I create my perfect little digital world and it's all nice and clean and happy. And then, um, and then Bamboo Ridge stuff. Yeah, that takes up a lot of time. But it's good, it's <laughs> yeah. good time, right? Like, cause you know, you spend some time doing something and at the end I can be like, hey, that's done. I did that you and did you good. know, it's, yeah. it's helping somebody or helping Bamboo Ridge. and. Yeah, so that's a good refuge. Or for example, uh, Tony, Tony Robles, it was one of his, I guess, writer goals or writer dreams to be published in Bamboo Ridge. And we picked one of his poems to be in this. And I just got such a kick out of it because on Facebook, he went and told his whole family that he got published <laughs> in Bamboo Ridge. And he was like, oh my gosh, my dream came true. And his whole family, like, you know, all these Filipinos were just making comments like, oh yes, good for you. And they were all excited, you know? And so like to, to experience that through them was, was good. I'm like, this is why we do it, you know? Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's a different level of being heard. Absolutely. Zach, what do you do to find refuge? Who, me? Oh, Zach. Who? Oh, Zach. Oh, Zach. Zach not no, Dara, you went there? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I went already. <laughs> Zach, um, Zach, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stay up to like midnight, actually. Uh, no, so, no, Refuge. No. Um, you know, uh, I usually, uh, I, I got into stand-up paddle boarding just about a year ago. And I loved it. I... I Prior to that, I, I didn't care much for the beach. Um, don't like crowds. But there was something that was similar to writing, which is this complete surrendering um, and, and just, I don't know, being open to, and you can't control the winds and the waters anyway. So um, it, it taught me a lot about that, which I was able to apply to my writing because I tend to be very controlling of my space and my time. Um, uh, but uh, that said, if I'm not doing that, I, I want to hang out with friends uh, because it's it's antithetical to writing because writing is such a solitary process. And mm -hmm. the friends kind of remind me that there's another side to to that life that's related, but it's, it's sort of like a recharging kind of um, um, moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly, thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the chat, so I'm going to go to one for Daryl. Um, Daryl, what about a boy, if any, that you missed a lot? And what about an uncle that you enjoy the most? Okay, is there a boy, I think he's saying, is there a boy that you missed a lot? And is there an uncle that you enjoy the most? I don't know. Um, I think there's a little bit of me and boy and maybe a composite uncle along with all the other Pake uncles. Um, and mostly it's sort of capturing the sound of the voice and from the sound comes these words and how they would say something and underneath it all is 
something that they were trying to teach me. And the boy, of course, thinks he knows it all and is probably a little resistant to what uncles are saying. Um, but then somewhere in, in there is some kind of truth that, you know, we're trying to figure out that, that, that mostly boys trying to figure out. Right. Um, but yeah. yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, that's it. I mean, oh. um, Daryl, so can... he's so modest. He's been writing boy and uncle pieces for a while now, and they've been published in various places. Um, and then Kuma Kahua did a collection of them uh, last year or the year before last year. Um, but if you read them, his boy and uncle different pieces, you you do see that boy is resistant and uncle, you know, is funny. Um, and there is that generation gap, but there is a lot of love in Daryl's writing between those two characters, and that really shines through. Sorry, Daryl, I had to. <laughs> no, absolutely right. You know, when you read those dialogues, um, so Daryl, I hope you do something with them, like in red print. Um, it's almost like a Dent Venn diagram. You have this body of knowledge that belongs to boy, and then you have this body of knowledge, you know, that is uncle. And then the boy, you know, sort of ends up crossing over a little bit to see, oh, okay, there's some, some real wisdom there. But I agree, it's it's just so warm and funny and intimate and, and familiar, you know, so. Okay, I'm gonna go to a question for um, another one for Nayo. Your writing does have some spoken word influences, but it seems to have some other influences. Can you name some poets, writers, other artists? Oh. Um. I mean, my friends, like, you know, who are mostly poets too, um, like Ken Arkine, William Nuutupu Giles, Noah Hele La, Joanna Gordon, um, they're, Carrie Rudzinski, they're amazing. Um, and then I, I guess uh, non poetry, um, like I watch TV and kind of, um, I don't know, like whatever is like, just kind of captures me. I don't ever really know what's going to like, um, I don't know if anybody knows the HBO show Deadwood. Um, it's like about um, like the old West or something, or the Dakota Hills, like mining and like the, the, town that was built there um and something about that inspired me to write about the uh white side of my family and um I wrote like a whole series of poems on that and so like it kind of is just or sometimes a song um I don't really have things I can name um like definitive names I can give like for other non-poetry things it's kind of just whatever hits me at the time so yeah it's I love that you're saying it's all, kind of just goes into this bank you know and and you don't know what's going to come out yeah that's very cool um we have one more question for the everybody uh but before we do that I do want to remind you that you can visit our website to get your copy of the book or find out more on future kipuka events that we'll be having um it's also on sale at local bookstores the shop and Namea. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest scoops. Okay, final question for you folks. Oh, okay, thank you. We have a link in the chat. Thanks, Misty. See, that's what I mean. She's so on it. Okay, um, to all, if you had the choice, which celebrity would you choose to voice your work in an audiobook? That's a hard question, yeah. Because as someone who listens to audiobooks because my eyes are wrecked, the narrator makes a difference. Big one. I don't think anybody could read any of Lee Tonucci's work in an audiobook except for Lee Tonucci. 
<laughs> I just I said like it could, it wouldn't work. Yeah. So I would take Lee Tonucci so. as a celebrity to read the Lee Tonucci. <laughs> For, for mine, I was going to choose Dara Lombra. Can only choose the legend himself. That's the only person hey. to choose. I would pick Zach. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, for a long time, he'd been working on a book about, pi about Pigeon, right? And then, so now we're still waiting for him to come out. <laughs> You want to talk about that a little bit, Zach? Uh, well, no, because I don't want to get to it. Um, okay, okay, okay. I'm actually going to be having a meeting next week. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, okay. Oh, good luck. Okay, voices, voices. I feel like, same with Serena. I kind of feel like, I'm um, sorry, Nayo. Um, I feel like, you know, they're... I'm sure people could do a really good job, but the words are so yours, you know, that I just can't really imagine. So you would be your own celebrity reader, uh, <laughs> which is my opinion of you and what you should answer. <laughs> but that's, that's what I think. That's, well, that's so nice. I, I actually have somebody though, like, yeah, it would be Misha Collins. Um, I'd have to teach him how to get the real down and the pronunciation, but I think once he got that, that would be amazing. Misha Collins is a poet, but he's um, mainly known for being the Angel Castiel on the show Supernatural. And oh, yes, that, I love that answer. Yeah, and I would <laughs> die if he nice. did. Nice. Let's make it happen. Yeah. DM, DM. <laughs> well, and then I guess the other question I asked or influences the other writers too. Um, it was a there was a second part that said any other um, yeah any other uh, writers want to talk about um, want to address what their influences have been poets writers or other artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can say that some of my writing influences, two of them are are in here right now, um, and that would be Lee and Daryl. And I'm lucky enough to have Daryl as a mentor and uh, Lee as a friend. Uh, but when I was in high school, I picked up an issue of Bamboo Ridge. And one of the first poems I saw was a poem that uh, Lee wrote about the number tree and how his uh, teacher at Punahou or, or yeah, Punahou was saying, it's not tree, it's three. Anyway, so I <laughs> love, I just love that poem. I latched onto it. And um and then I started reading more Bamboo Ridge and I picked up Daryl Lum's son. And after that, I was hooked. And um, I, the first time I met Nayo actually was in a workshop for Pigeon with Lee, Lee Tonucci. <laughs> wow. And we both had the same answer because Lee was like asking us, what do you enjoy? What, make, you know, what do you enjoy about reading or writing Pigeon? And both of us had said, we wrote it down and we had to read out our answers out loud. And we both said that it's, it brings us joy. Like when you hear it, it's joyful. So I always remember that. Like, oh yeah, you know, Naya was that girl who said the same thing me as me in front of Lee Tonucci. Nice. <laughs> well, one of my refuges is Brenda Kwan's uh, Yoga Nidra class, oh. which I've been doing twice a week ever since the pandemic started. So I find myself channeling uh, Brenda. It's sort of like I'm watching Deadwood on TV, except it's Brenda because it's on <laughs> Zoom. And so I find myself coming out with these very interesting sort of statements, like, you know, the person you want to be in this world. And so I've really, I've really gotten a lot from the yoga other than um, flex. And I have to yeah. say, though, too, that following, following Brenda on social media is also a help through through the, the pandemic because she has so many good quotes and like just calming things to share. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, um, Daryl, no wait, influences, did you tell us? Oh, the, the, the early pigeon riders, Milton Moriyama, it, it's Sakamoto. Um, yeah, and a long time ago, uh, scholar Stephen Sumida and Arnold Hura did a uh, uh, annotated bibliography of 
Hawaii literature. And um, for many of us, that was the first time we realized that we were, we didn't invent pigeon in, in literature. You know, it went back to, I think the earliest ones they found was from like, not like 1920. So um, as an influence, it, it was a realization that I wasn't the only one that I come in a, in a long line of Hawaii writers, some of who used pigeon. Um, and so that's my sort of influence and sort of acknowledging um, our literary history. Yeah? I can't even imagine how exciting that must have been to suddenly go, oh my gosh, you know, there, there are others, you know, before us. Um, Zach, what is, oh, and first of all, it is four o'clock. So if you need to log off, thank you for joining us and please check out the book. And if you're okay hanging out a little bit more, then we'll just finish up this question. Okay, so Zach, influences, whether literary or not, or both? Well, I think like in the beginning, when I started writing, the influences were some writers that were closer to home and that gave visibility and voice to um, my immediate community, right? Um, so this would be like local writers, Filipinos, both in, from the Philippines and Hawaii as well as Filipinos in America. But then, you know, like we go through phases and influences, I think they start shifting once you become more comfortable with being uh, a writer. They, they, they shift from influences more than uh, to, towards inspiration. So now I read just to get inspired or I, I, I read to get, to be reminded of, um, of why I'm even doing this in the beginning, in the first place. So I, I also, um, uh, so I now I've been going back. So like this pigeon English pro anthology that I've worked on for the past, it was my pandemic book project. Um, I, it, it was my way of uh, going back to, I guess, one of my earlier roots Found an early foundation as a writer, and um, and the realization that, like Daryl said, that you know this language that gets overlooked even by mainland uh, or continental U.S. readers and and even Asian Americans that there's nothing, no language like it in the in the U.S. where a language that's co-created by a bunch of different ethnic groups and people, I don't think you can say the same thing for any language in America. And, um, and it's, it's, and which, which makes, I think, Hawaii so special, you know, um, that, um, you know, we don't have to leave the Tower of Babel. We can just stay in there and create our own language out of necessity. I don't think we sat, we, we went in there to, with the intention to invent a language. I think it was just, out of this hunger to to communicate, and I think that that's why I write. It's it's this it's this need to connect and communicate. Um, Zach, I remember that you had talked about the difference between Luna Pigeon and um, the pigeon that was used among the workers. You know, so it was mostly commands, right? Which was not a communal language, but what everybody was speaking to each other was. Yeah, it's fascinating. I wish we could talk more, honestly. I have so many questions for all of you, um, but I, I think you have lives and other things to do like that. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Zach, for logging in from six hours away. Um, please, please, please check out the issue and thank you for being with us. Aloha. Thanks, Brenda. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>